afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Conference of the Trees here at the New York Times Climate Hub. Um, welcome to all of you joining us online as well. I'm particularly excited about this session, which is entitled Hearts and Minds, Storytelling and Climate Change. Um, we have a fantastic panel um, for, for this session. Um, but before filmmaker Alice Eady comes out and introduces her panel, um, I would like to thank YouTube, who are the, the, the supporter of this event. We're very grateful for them. And I'd like, just like to play a very short video. Thank you. It's a global issue. Climate change doesn't affect everyone equally. It's going to hit those who have done the least to cause this issue the hardest. The developed countries in the world have created this crisis, and the people who are paying most as a consequence are the poorest people in the world. What a gross injustice. I'm speaking with those who don't have a seat at the political table, gathering stories on my journey to COP26 in Glasgow, where I'll show them to world leaders, the decision makers who hold the future of life on Earth in their hands. Hope isn't just sitting back, wishful thinking. Hope for the future depends on each one of us doing our bit. This is where we go. We need to hear from the people who are on the front lines of this issue. We're stronger when we work together. We have a very short window. Our survival is at stake. Together we can achieve this. This issue has never felt more urgent. And there's never been a more important time to take action. I was not warned that the face of my partner, Jack Harris, would be projected on this screen so big before coming up. Welcome, everyone. Yeah. I'm so, so happy to be here. Um, as a filmmaker working on projects like this and many others, there is a single question I ask myself. How do we tell better stories about the existential crisis that we are facing? How do we tell stories that move people beyond despair? I'm so excited first to introduce Emmy Mahmoud to the stage. She is going to share with us a piece of poetry. She has the incredible title of world champion poet. She is an author and also a UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador. Welcome, Emmy. Good luck. Hi, everyone. Super exciting to be here, also nervous, so here goes. <laughs> uh, this poem is titled Di Baledna, or This Is Our Home. If you are reading this, I forgive you. You have grown far from the heart of me, my child, have lost the familiar love we held for one another in your first years of life. When you were young, you marveled at the plants and critters that ran across my bosom. You worshipped the water, swam up and down my rivers, you drank from my rain, laughed at each first snow, begged for sun on the cloudy days. You didn't hesitate to sink your fingers into the mud of me and tickle loose little droplets, seedlings, and worms. How you built a refuge for every wayward wanderer, lining the kitchen shelves and jars of lightning bugs and butterflies. You drank the breeze from my trees, the honey, sap, and gum with joy and ease. How you came to me, resting your head at my tender hearth, your weary body in my pockets. You loved me. You nurtured me before you knew what it was to nurture, tended me before you knew what it was to tend. 
You nurtured me before you knew what it was to nurture, tended me before you knew what it was to tend. Tiller, sower, farmer, green-summed little one, you knew me. Lately, you hurt me. You break and cut and tear into me, and I forgive you. For I am a part of you, like your brothers and sisters before you and those who are close to me now, so I forgive you. I forgive you again for the reaping you do with no intention to sow, again for the waste and greed and gluttony when you were young. You ask me why they do this. Once brothers and sisters, now spilling the blood of your people, staining the earth with the blood of your people. Tearing apart the branches of your family tree. You losing ground and hope all in one fell swoop, you turn to me. Resting beneath the shade of date palms and magnolias, you begged me to make sense of it all. All I could offer you then was a promise. But now there isn't much left for me to promise. They've dug pits into my sides, have stolen the rubies, gold, and diamonds, my a place in my thighs. I do all I can to heal, but my Weary body won't clear away the hurt so easily. My waters rush but do not soothe. The air in my lungs suffocates the little ones. I cough and spew and gush and bruise and it will not heal when a child of mine dies by my hands. Here in the long forgotten valley of your youth, visitors come, not of their own accord but by necessity. And I am made whole again. Abdul Ghani and Izhara sink their hands into the mud of me, saplings cling, and I am whole again. Hatim builds monuments to my skies, captures the sun, channels the lightning, and I am whole again. Luca and Layatu surround their home in fruit born of me, and I'm made whole again. The children eat and grow and heal and are happy. Asman protests, it isn't mine alone to mend, he says. I need you. I need you to build and build again, to make new, to bring forth life from relentless earth, to make an oasis of charred terrain, creating refuge from nothing but scar tissue and lightning strikes. Let me be more to you than just a final resting place. Let me do more for you than call you home, child of mine. If you are reading this, I need you, your mother. If this land could speak, would she thank us, praise us, would she ridicule us or beg us? Would her voice be weary, gentle, disdainful? Would it shake with sorrow, with rage? I used to wonder at these things all the time. When at 11 years old, I watched my neighbor's house crumble before my eyes. The floodwaters washed away the earth and clay most people used to build their homes. To see her wade through her home like that, to watch her try and salvage what little she had left, our country was already locked in turmoil, and now the earth began to purge us too. If you could stop the next tornado from hitting your home, the next hurricane from wiping out your city, the next drought from starving your people, the next lightning strike from ending your life, wouldn't you? The locusts in the Horn of Africa the ice in Chicago, the floods in South Sudan, the fire in Australia, California, the threat of rain that won't stop or rest that won't come, fire or ice, how will the world end? I don't know, but I don't want to find out, not in our generation and not in the next. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Oliver. What is it? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Emmy, thank you so much. No, that was thank beautiful. You. Thanks for having so me. So let me introduce the rest of our panelists. Can you hear me? Yeah. But, yeah. So, to my left, we have Oliver Jeffers, uh, the innovative artist who's piece you can actually see right now on the Blue Zone, which is beautiful, Emmy, who we've already met, um, the science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robertson, and the director of the Natural History Museum, Doug Kerr. We also have two people joining us virtually. There they are. <laughs> Welcome to the Canadian-based filmmaker and activist, Stanley Jewell Kemker, and Matthew, hi Matt, Matthew Anderson, the European culture editor at the New York Times. 
and he will be hosting the session. Um, just to say that at the end, we'll have about five to seven minutes for questions, so um, get your questions ready. Matthew, over to you in Berlin. Hi, Alice, thanks so much. And thank you everyone for coming. I'm so disappointed that I can't be with you today. I did try to get there, but I've been kept from you by a total meltdown uh, at the airport in Berlin, which by the way is the best argument I've ever heard for uh, never flying anywhere ever again. But we will, uh, we will soldier on. And I'm so glad that the organizers of the New York Times uh, Climate Hub have made some time for the arts and culture to be represented in the program. COP26, the great and good of business, politics, and civil society are all uh, gathered. But there is also a role for people who concern themselves with storytelling, uh, with emotions, with psychology, to play a role in ensuring a future in which humans can continue to live on the planet. And telling stories is a key part of that. But I think it's also a double-edged sword because the arts are not marketing and they're not public relations. And artists need to tread carefully, I think, in order to avoid being seen as heavy-handed or uh, preachy. And those of us who run public institutions uh, may also be under pressure to avoid uh, crusading or, um, or coming on too strong with a message. So uh, it, it, it's a complicated environment, I think, in which all artists and creators uh, are functioning. I'd like to start uh, with a question for Oliver. He's a, an artist and an illustrator, and, uh, and he's got some work uh, there at COP26 at the moment. But one of the m works that, of his works that people will know best is, uh, is a children's book, uh, Here We Are, or a book which is certainly popular with children, definitely popular with their parents as well. Uh, which helps young people and adults as well to understand their position in an environment and the interconnectedness of, uh, of, of things uh, around. I want to ask Oliver uh, to start with, how much do you think about changing the way that your reader thinks, or are you happy just to present that and see where it goes? Uh, no, I think that is one of the most important things, um, but one of the most fundamental things I think I've come to realize over the last year or so is that nobody will ever respond well to be told, to being told that they're wrong. And, you know, you sort of almost get a, uh, a reaction of resistance, of anger. Uh, and, and I think that book is, I think, is a manifest of the, when you can break something down to be simple enough, you can really speak to people in a way where you all agree, uh, agree on the basic fundamentals of, of many, many things. I have yet to meet anybody who thinks that they're an asshole or who wants to be an asshole. All, all people are, I think, fundamentally good people, and we all kind of want the same things. And here's some of the pictures of the, the, the pieces that I have. In the green zone, there is this one called Celestial Census Results. And it just says, you know, all the people live here. And then when you get to the moon, uh, it says no one lives here or anywhere else. And it, you know, it's just making things just so obviously simple. And when uh, I had a, uh, a, my first son, I was just walking around explaining what he could see, you know, oh, it got dark, that's nighttime, oh, there's trees, so on, and was just explaining the very, very, very simple things. And at that point, you know, there was a lot of anger at the time. It was whenever uh, Trump was first running for president of the USA, it was when Brexit was happening here. And, they just felt that there was this anger. And so in some of the pages, it was things like, um, uh, you're a person. Um, uh, all people come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. We may all look different, act different, and sound different, but don't be fooled, we are all people. And just when you get to something at, at that level of simplicity, it's hard to find somebody who's willing to disagree with you. Uh, and that's what I was finding when I was touring around with this book, is that it didn't offend anybody. Well, apart from it never got published in Russia because they wouldn't let me include the two wives getting married. Uh, so we, we, we didn't include that book. But I think it's that. I think it's if you can see something and say it in a way that you think will help people understand, then, then that's what I do. It's not like I'm trying to tell them there's a different way. I think I'm just trying to help point out the right questions. I think we've lost audio on you, Matt. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah. Slater, I was wondering if you take a different view of that. You, the website of your film, Youth Unstoppable, describes you as a, a filmmaker and climate activist. And so obviously changing people's minds and their behaviours is at the forefront of your, uh, of your practice. Is, when you made your film, are you trying to make a contribution to cinema or are you trying to change people's, change the way they live their lives? Or is it a bit of both? It's interesting, when I when I first started making uh, my documentary, I didn't consider myself an activist. Um, I very much went into it believing that I was a filmmaker and I wanted to, to help share the stories of, of young people of my generation. And as I, as I grew up and as I went on this journey of, of filming young people and trying to capture their stories when no one else was listening, um, I, I realized that uh, it was maybe impossible for me to not be a climate activist because um, my generation and I, we've had to grow up faster. We've had to step into roles of questioning and leadership because our leaders who we um, were told to trust in and to um, hope that everything would be uh, going for the best uh, were letting us down. So I think for the this generation and for the generations that are coming, it's it's hard to not be an activist because we are essentially fighting for not only a right to speak um, in our own lives, but to survive. I was interested by what Oliver said about simplicity and making something sort of so simple that you can't agree with it. And I saw you nodding while he was talking, but your film is not a simple film. There's a lot of complexity in it. And I wonder how you as an artist manage that in terms of making things clear enough and readable enough to be understood and also not misrepresenting the, the material by making it seem simpler than it really is. Mm -hmm. For me, it was really important that um, when young people watch this film that they, um, that I don't necessarily need to include uh, the entirety of all of the science behind what climate change is, that I don't need to include um, everything that makes up the backbone of why this is the most important crisis um, that we have to face. What I want is for people to feel an emotional connection to this issue. Um, storytelling is how, we, is how we learn about ourselves and the world around us when we're growing up, much like you were saying of how you were explaining to, to your child that you know this is a tree, this is darkness, these are the stars. Um, it is inherently part of what it means to be human is to to tell stories and to connect on that level. So yes, the film is more complex than saying this is this and this is that, but but I think at its at its heart, it is simple in the fact of just trying to show that we are all human and that we are all interconnected and that as we move forward, that is going to be an enormous part of how we're actually able to figure out this problem. Doug, you run an institution, but you're also involved in the process of telling stories about the climate uh, to a public. So at the Natural History Museum at the moment, uh, the exhibition which is running is Our Blo Broken Planet, How We Got There and Ways to Fix It. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how you as an administrator, rather than as an artist who, uh, who makes artistic decisions, how you go about bringing these stories to a public. <coughs> Thank you very much. So so look, museums have always been defined and are defined first and foremost by their collections. We're about the physical collections we have. Um, but we know, and we've known for a long time, that an object or a specimen is so much more powerful when you start to tell stories about it. Um, so I'll give you a simple example. I was, I was at our museum in Tring the other day, and Alex Bond, our bird curator, took me behind the scenes, and he, he opened a drawer and he drew out a bird's nest. And it's a small nest like this. It's utterly beautiful. I mean, imagine a sort of Japanese pot entirely woven by the smallest, thinnest pieces of sort of grass you've ever seen. And you look at it, and it has a magic and a power just in and of itself. Um, but then he added a story. He said, this, this nest, this is the nest of a particular species of Hawaiian flycatcher. Um, but this species went extinct in the 19th century. This is the only nest in the whole world and there will never be any others. And suddenly that specimen has taken on a whole new dimension of power because you told a story about it that gets you straight into the heart of extinction, biodiversity, human activity that caused that extinction. 
Um, so when you take broken planets, and crucially, as you said, it's our broken planet, how we got here, and ways to fix it, because we do know that if we want to create advocacy and action, it has to be done through a message of hope, as I think, as Oliver said. Um, very simply there, we approached our scientists. Um, we asked each of our scientists to nominate one specimen. Crucially, one specimen, one story. So if you visit the exhibition, you'll find that it's a series of stories. You know, each exhibit is simply one specimen, the story that that scientist wanted to tell, grouped into themes about the impact of humanity. And then finally, and this is slightly new for us, but it's been very effective, we actually included a photograph of the storyteller. So actually that gives you another layer in which you've got the storyteller, the story, and the object. And that's done at scale. We have had over 300 nominations. There are about 40 stories, if you like, in the exhibition into three themes. Uh, I have to say the, the visitor response has been unbelievably powerful. It's just got us into a whole new debate. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think Oliver was coming. Yeah, no, I was just saying possibly it feels powerful for them because they feel connected to it. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and it's really interesting. I mean, this was pitched at a 18 to 25 year old audience. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, we have science explainers in there. And normally, if you're a science explainer, it's, you know, which way are the dinosaurs and where are the toilets and can I get a cup of coffee? Uh, the explainers have said they've had such a different set of conversations. You know, it's a five year old coming in and saying, you know, well, well, tell me, why is beef a problem? And, and actually, mummy, when we go home tonight, can we have plant burgers, not beef burgers? So, so actually, they found it an incredibly enriching opportunity to tell stories that you can make relevant to all sorts of audiences. And, and we believe passionately that those stories and all the brilliant storytellers we have here, that is what drives action, that is what drives advocacy. I was interested to hear you talk about giving a sense of hope, and I thought maybe we could bring Kim in on that, because Kim is understood mostly as a science fiction writer, uh, and some of his stories are set in a future that would in other books be a dystopia, but that's not how it works in those. It's a future in which the climate has changed the way that we live, but it's a picture in which there is hope as well. Kim, I wonder if you could tell us, do you think of that as a, 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 your role as a novelist, to give us hope? I am a science fiction writer, and I've spent the last 30 years writing what uh, it's correct to call utopian science fiction. Mm -hmm. So when you think a story into the future, you have to pick a single line of history and run it out. Um, if you run it out five million years, you've got space opera, and that's what most people think science fiction is. If you only go out a century or less, then you're doing a kind of a uh, projective realism uh, because our own time is changing so fast that only by pitching it a little bit in the future can you catch the sense of change that we're in. So those futures could be um, good or bad. The Anthropocene could be a good Anthropocene or it could be a bad Anthropocene. If you choose to describe the bad ones, which many do for dramatic effect and maybe as a warning you get dystopia, if you choose to present positive futures, you're writing utopian science fiction. Um, over the last 30 years, what my definition of utopian has been has, uh, the bar has lowered. And I, uh, in reference to Emmy's poem, um, the earth can restore itself. And the only thing that we can't recover from is extinctions, precisely. So if we were to get through the 21st century um, without a mass extinction event, this is like a new definition of utopian science fiction. <laughs> um, Sounds and, achievable. Yeah, well, achievable. We need to work hard. We are yes. trembling on the brink of a polycrisis that will indeed bring down mass extinctions and, of course, hammer humans as well. So in this moment, um, it's definitely the case that writing uh, uh, positive futures is the reason that I'm here. I'm not the only one. There are young science fiction writers. They call themselves solar punk or hope punk. I would say they're still writing utopian science fiction, but they want to dodge that dangerous word utopia, which has a heavy political charge and a history that sometimes um, can be used as a weapon against it. But I merely mean, like H.G. Wells, a positive uh, future for humanity going forward, that in itself is a kind of utopian science fiction. Kim, do you think that there is, I mean, it's not what you do and it's not, you know, you, you present a, a positive vision, but do you think that there is also a room 
for artists to frighten us or scare us or shake us out of our complacency uh, to, to realize that, that action is needed? Well, maybe. I mean, utopia is about our hopes. Dystopia is about our fears. We all have both. It's easier to scare people than to nurture their hopes. So dystopia is easy. And for our culture, for the, uh, um, the prosperous developed West, contemplating dystopia is almost a kind of comfort food where you can say to yourself, well, at least we're not like these poor people who are eating each other. And uh, we're already all scared enough. So I would insist that the, the, the positive stories are the needed ones now. We are already scared out of our minds. I, I would say that I think hope is actually much more powerful than fear. It's, I would like to uh, follow that by saying hope is subtle, but it's also biological, like bacteria have hope. When you're hungry, you're hoping for food. So there's a deepness to hope that I yeah. think is quite powerful. Yeah. Oliver, how do you go about cultivating ho hope in younger audiences? Uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a relatively grown-up emotion or uh, aspiration. How do you go about making that something I mean, I, that... I don't know if it's a grown-up emotion. I mean, you know, try telling that to my three-year-old who wants a biscuit from the cupboard. Um, but it's... Uh, I suppose I don't necessarily set out by going, um, here's, here's what I want to tell people. Um, I think what, what's more important for me is, is I try to convey what I feel and by doing that try to help other people uh, feel something similar. Uh, and as I say, I do think hope is, is more powerful than fear. Uh, and, and I do think that we are uh, at the tail end of a couple of generations where fear has been sensationalized and is better for business. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that life is actually not that bad for most people on the planet. I think statistically it's probably the best it's ever been across the entire planet. Uh, and it, things are getting better. People want to improve. And, and in some ways I think that we were talking about this earlier, I, it's not even a climate problem I think we face. I think it's a people problem. And people just need to unite behind the same better story, the same story of hoping that they can be involved and that they, are, they matter somehow. But do we have that collective vision? No, I, possibly, but maybe it's not being heard in the noise. Why are we so much better at telling stories of dystopia than of, of positive futures? Because it, it's easier done, as Kim said. More explosions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, easier to sell. Yeah. You made me laugh when uh, you were talking about, well, the bar is sort of in hell because it's, uh, <laughs> it's like, well, let's just make sure people don't get extinct. I laugh because it's just too close to home. Uh, my dad is from a village that doesn't exist anymore. And he's in his 60s, right? And um, so it's like when people think about extinction or when they think about things not existing anymore or these mass events that lead to you know, uh, death on grand scales, kind of like what we saw with COVID and things like that. People think it's far away, it can't touch us, it's not something very immediate, um, but the reality is that if you're living on the front lines of the effects of these things that we're here talking about, it's really, really easy to dismiss abstractions, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about climate change as an abstraction, we talk about extinction as an abstraction, we talk about refugees or conflict or things that ne don't necessarily sound like anything to us except for these big phrases or hot button issues, but what it looks like on the ground, or what I try to capture in the poem at least, and why I think storytelling is important. It's also funny because I'm a, a stealth scientist. I actually studied anthropology and molecular cellular developmental biology and got a certificate in global health um, at Yale. Well, just the rest of should leave, no? <laughs> I was like, I'm a scientist. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. guys. Um, I but I, I choose poetry. I choose to use poetry to reach people because I think it's how you reach people where they least expect to be reached. It's how you, what you talked about in the beginning about you don't necessarily go up to someone and say, hey, so what you're doing is kind of, you know, killing everyone. No, you, you come up to them and you sort of say, listen, where is the common ground that we can all find? I know that somewhere in there, um, there is a compelling enough reason for you to want to act. There's going to be a reason or a way for you to shift your priorities. Let's figure out what all of our priorities are and how we can shift them to help one another and to prioritize one another. So for me, um, I love reading science fiction, dystopia, and utopia, and you name it, because, and also I love bacteria. <laughs> when I was little, I remember being like, people will lie to you, but bacteria never will. I was such a nerd. I was just such a nerd. But, <laughs> yeah. 
what I'm trying to say is, I really, really, really fully um, understand what you're saying, and I agree with all of you. It's, it's really, really important how you present something Agreed. because it allows someone to step out of their bubble, to step out of their own world and sort of into a reality where we really are equal. And that's why I'm actually really happy to be here because we're here supposedly as equals. And I think that we, well, I say supposedly because there's a lot of security and like different things going on. But, but what I'm trying to say is that if we're all here having this conversation, because when you're in a flood, it's not going to matter how many PhDs you have, what country you run, you know, how big your endowment is. It's just going to matter how fast you can swim or like how, what your house was built out of. Um, so what I'm trying to say is I'm glad that we're here together. And I, the bar is in hell, but we're pretty close to it. I think so. you made a really good point there yeah. when you were saying that uh, if you can find that compelling enough reason with that person, it's, it's you're, you're not telling them that they're wrong or anything like that, but you're just sort of trying to shift the filter on the lens of their story. And, and you know, I say this sort of only half choking. It's like, well, the context for most people is, is often, you know, their mother or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and if you can get deep enough down, to the, the real core of how somebody feels, you can turn the dial even just the slightest slightest amount and that has a huge impact. And, yeah. and a lot of times, you know, art is almost dismissed as the how it's how an event is framed, uh, as in, you know, like the icing on the cake. But it's I think art and storytelling are, are not just that. They're they're not even the cake, it's the table upon which the cake sits. I love it, yeah. Can yeah. I just, just pick on that just, just, sorry, yeah, yeah. but um, I really I want to come back on the extinction point because I think it goes yeah. right to the heart of this so one. And um, we know a little bit about extinction at the museum because if you think about the Earth, it's been around for four and a half billion years. That's four and a half thousand million years. And life evolved about three and a half thousand million years ago, three and a half billion years ago. It's an unimaginable amount of time. Uh, but we know from the fossil record that there have been five mass extinction events, only five in three and a half thousand million years. And that means a period of a few years or a few decades when almost all the life disappeared, between 75 and 93% just went. So it can happen. Um, actually, I don't think it is that lower bar because you know, if you want the scary version, all the data is telling us we're heading for a sixth mass extinction. And remember, the last one was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs all went. So, so would that's, you? that's the scary bit, yeah. yeah. But what I love is the fact that you're all here saying, but we know, because we've done a lot of work on this with our audiences, that's not a very helpful message. Because you go, oh my goodness, I'm a dinosaur, I'm dead, what can I do? And people walk away. Whereas actually, if you offer them hope, you offer them, no, actually, yes, it's not great, and yes, we have to change, but there is a credible path out of this. We can reverse biodiversity loss. We can solve the climate crisis. There is hope, and if you offer that, and I think the work you all do is so amazing because it tells those stories so brilliantly, in, in our experience, you tend to find the audiences respond much more positively mm -hmm. and are much more likely to take action. Yeah, I 100% agree, oh, sorry. I 100% agree with you because you know, um, the reason for me uh, that it's really important to just stop talking in abstractions is because, um, you know, I did, my dad, thankfully, is alive, right? His village doesn't exist anymore. Um, his way of life doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, we live somewhere else now, and <laughs> I'm alive. Uh, and a lot of the people that I actually met with ahead of here, you know, they're on the front lines of this crisis, but they're innovating with very little resources, and they're making do where they are. Can you imagine, you know, leaving your home, uh, because of conflict, coming to a new place where it's supposed to be safe, and then being again, you know, completely accosted, and you have your whole life threatened by climate change, right? And then you, they, the work that they try to do to address this, building solar panels and running like an entire uh, camp, you know, on solar energy, refugees being uh, part of every single stage from the planning all the way to the implementation phase, people who are have lost everything several times over, and like you said, are bringing the hope. And for me, the hope is actually what upends all the abstractions that we talk about. We talk about all of these goals and all of these you know, um, huge terms, but when you put one person in front of another and you say, hey, here's what I've done, where is the halfway point or three quarters way point that you can meet me at? I'm People are willing, willing to, to cover that distance, yeah. And um, it's, it's such a frustration that the, we, we have brilliant brains, and coming from Northern Ireland, uh, knowing political violence, I am deeply distrustful of nationalism and patriotism, but yet this seems to consume most of the energy of these brilliant brains of ours. And that's such a frustration. Emmy, can I come back to you? Um, 
the stories we choose to tell is important, but also who tells them exactly, yeah. is equally as important. Um, you're talking about lived experience. Are we hearing from those who are being disproportionately impacted by this issue? Yes, yeah. we are all going to be impacted, but not equally. Are we hearing from the voices that are, are yeah. on the front lines? Thank you for saying that. Um, that's actually the only reason that I'm here, uh, because I'm here because I feel like a lot of times when people talk about the climate or when they think of climate change, even me when I was little, I was 12 years old, first science fair project was about um, climate change and it, I did linear regressions yeah. on thousands of years of data at 12 years old and I looked at, I looked at, it was just linear regression. So it was just looking at just the temperatures and then I saw the ice ages and heat waves and all the different, you know, long history of the earth that you're talking about. Even then, you know, we think of that, we think of temperature, we think of polar bears, we think of penguins, we think of maybe a couple of different other things that are also, you know, not always the human face. You don't think of humans being the people who are, the people who are impacted the most at the end and I think that's why um, what I, my hope is from coming here and from this COP being different than other COPs, so COP26 hopefully being the time where people realize that it's real people who are impacted but also real people who have the solutions. And so if we're able to put ourselves and our you know, egos aside and really just sit down and learn either from refugees or from people who are innovating on the ground who are more impacted, people from more vulnerable countries. I say it from a degree of privilege as well because I'm American. I'm Sudanese American, so I guess I understand like different sides, but um, more vulnerable countries tend to have to bear the brunt of a lot of what we're doing, but they also bear the brunt of the change as well because if they don't innovate fast enough, the place that they're currently living in might not exist in 10 years, 12 years. So I think I love what you said, Alice, because it's really important to say who are we hearing from? What stories are we prioritizing? What voices are we lifting up? And which voices are we sort of dismissing as this is just the kind of thing that happens in those sort of countries or this is the kind of thing that happens in less developed areas. I have a lot of hope and optimism and um, you know, I saw it in the audience and I see it from you guys after saying the poem. You know, poetry is so much easier to reach people. Um, I think it, it will open people's minds up and what your question is and just, just that idea that if we really, really give ourselves a chance to listen to one another and not based on our valuing systems that tend to value certain countries, certain degrees, certain you know, prestige, and um, instead think of our, uh, each other as like, we're really, really here just trying to be each other's keepers. Um, I think that'll change a lot of things. So I hope uh, maybe if you guys have ideas, maybe how are we gonna hear more from those voices? What I'm doing is I'm trying to bring as many voices as I can who can't be here. I spoke for Hatim, for um, Abdul Ghani, Zahara, um, sorry, Luca, Layatu, and Hamida, and a, a lot of other people because they can't be here to speak for themselves in this moment and they gave me permission to share those stories. My family, my neighbor, my father, and so, you know, I want to ask, who can you bring into the circle? Mm. I'm feeling a collaboration here between Emmy yeah. and the Natural Absolutely. History Museum. Sounds good. Um, Matthew, get going. <laughs> Matthew, we have a few moments left, so I'm going to come to you for a final question and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Sure. I just wanted to, to bring Slater in on that. Uh, oh, oh, on that point, and I wondered in terms of um, as a as a young person and a young activist who's very much made a sort of voice of a generation film, if you could talk a bit about how you want the the picture of what that generation is thinking to fit into a broader picture. Um, the question being to fit into a broader picture. Um, well, I think what young people want is not only a seat at the table, they also, uh, there is this, this insistence and this, this hope that the table can be changed, that we have indigenous voices, that we have, um, we have global south voices, that we not only have a more diverse conversation that's happening, but we realize that um, UN climate change conferences and COPs aren't the only place where this needs to be happening. Yes, COP26 is, I almost said COP16, it's been so long. COP26 is important, but, um, and it is the only place that we can come together on this international scale. But we also need to remember that um, very much like 
our sense of hope needs to have you know many facets the solution isn't just one grand idea of well if we do this then we save everything it's having these kinds of conversations at cops but it's also working with our communities at home and it's working with young people and indigenous communities and farming communities and it's making sure that we can reach people where they are um, i live in a very rural conservative area and what i'm focusing on now is trying to create a dialogue between the farming communities who, yes, they're ninth generation, but are still um, kind of acting within a colonial um, settler mentality. They are using pesticides, trying to bring them to a conversation with indigenous groups because you know we all love this place that we live. We all want to have a healthy, a healthy and happy life. We want to make sure that our kids are able to experience the beauty that we've been able to in our lives. And those kinds of conversations, I think, are happening now. They're happening on a smaller scale. They're happening. They're just not being seen because um, they aren't the usual players that are at this uh, kind of conversation. OK, Matthew, if you're happy, I'm going to go to questions from the audience. We're going to have mics um, roaming. So please put up your hands if you have a question here at the front. One minute, please. Hi. So my question is, uh, how important is synthesis of different forms of media? I mean, you all come from different backgrounds in the arts. How important is that in portraying messages of hope across generational divides or geographical divides? How do you build a message of hope for everyone from different places in the arts? Could you just pick up in the beginning of your question, because I missed that. Uh, so how important is synthesis of different forms of arts in portraying messages of hope? Messages of hope, Slater and Matthew, I, I hope that you heard that. Um, is that directed to the panel or someone in particular? Yeah, just everyone. Everyone who would like to take, take think, that one. I think we, we sort of touched on that a little bit earlier, which is uh, if, if you're saying something that uh, sort of cuts to a, a, a simple enough and a deep enough core, then it doesn't really matter who you are, what your experience is. You, you can speak to the, just the, the basic principles of, of what it is to be a human being alive on Earth in the 21st century. Um, so, uh, you know, some, when you were saying earlier that, that yeah, you said about uh, different nationalities and different sort of uh, jurisdictions, uh, and that is, that, that has become such a large part of it is um, where, you know, the, the ways in which we divide ourselves. And, uh, and I think something that, that we can help do as artists is, remind people that everybody is so busy trying to be understood that they forget to try and understand. Yeah. And I think if, if we can help push that along, I think that could go some way. Um, sorry, I just have a very short, simple answer. One of the things that inspired me the most, um, you know, and I, I actually agree a lot with what you said. Well, I don't think you can see me pointing to you, but what you said earlier um, is that our generation can be very disillusioned because we're seeing it and we're experiencing it. What I like doing is looking at success stories in terms of climate. And so there's a lot of different projects that I saw on the ground and that I'm seeing every day. So just uh, search up different things that you saw actually worked for climate change and then maybe tell yourself and others or like change the conversation instead of to what are you going to do for climate change? Say, here's what I'm willing to do. Um, what are you willing to do? Maybe we can do more together uh, sort of thing. And that helps you wake up every day. <laughs> and that's like my answer, my simple answer. But yeah. Doug, I'll come to you. We literally have a couple of minutes. Yeah, sorry, so a, a very quick one. I was just going to say, I think there's a universality you're hearing here. And I'm just going to put a teeny little plug in for one series of voices we don't hear a lot, which is actually the voices of nature. So we have, again, if you come to Broken Planet, you'll find one exhibit there. It's very simple. It's literally 23, one specimen each, 23 of the 24 extinct British bee species. 24th doesn't exist in any form anymore. And it's a sort of way of, actually, when you look at it, the beauty, the engineering, what nature has created, somehow actually allowing some of these creatures who are e equally under threat as we are as a species, a sort of voice. And we tend to find that's quite a universal voice. You know, everybody loves a bee. Slater, I think you want to say something. I, I am agreeing with everyone that is on the panel. I think, um, and in to, to, to respond to that question, I think we need multiple kinds of stories being told. Everyone reacts differently. There is the universality of that we are all human and all interconnected. But I love what you're saying because we do need to fall back in love with nature. There is this disconnect. And I think I, I love that the space that you're in is, um, is a forest and there is that light 
but wouldn't it be amazing if we could have a gathering of people or an important conversation like this actually in a forest and reconnecting with what that means and why it's beautiful and worth saving. And it's not just worth saving because humans like it, it's worth saving because it simply exists. And I think that's um, something we need to remember. We wish you were here with us later in the beautiful space. Um, Kim, what would you say? <clears throat> yeah, I was thinking to myself that fiction is really finding the universal in the particulars, that it's always about individual characters and plots and settings. But maybe that's true of all art, really, and also all exhibits. Um, you've got your particulars, and you don't want to go immediately to the abstract. And that's the way art works. In that particular, you hope to hit a universal. And this is how it has to happen. I think we are just out of time. I can't believe it, because I only took one question. I'm so sorry. Oh, do we have to wrap up? Should we do one more question? Please. OK, come on, let's do it. Here at the front. Oh, over time. Hi, over time. I have a question for you. Uh, you're all very talented at artists, and of course, you're wonderful storytellers. I worry about the kinds of stories that governments and uh, politicians need to tell their uh, constituents to be able to push policies and sometimes difficult policies along and to have people embrace the kind of change that needs to take place if we're going to save the planet. So what advice do you have for people who are not talented like you but who need to tell really important stories. Who wants to take that one? Hire Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, no, I, I think that um, the, these, um, the leaders you're talking about are probably quite talented storytellers or else they wouldn't have gotten to the position that they are. <laughs> and so one of the stories to be told is that of shared sacrifice and for the children. Um, the Ministry for the Future is the title of the novel that got me here, but we are all working for various ministries for the future. And so that future directed the idea of a project, that we do these things now to make a better future later. And I want to just quickly reference Doug's point. If we do dodge a mass extinction event, that is not indeed a low bar. It's going to be hard to do, but if we do it, all kinds of things will have had to gone right. It will be a full employment project. It will be an equity project. It will be something indigenous people have to be closely involved in. And our cousins, our fellow creatures on the planet, will be very pleased as well. So um, yeah, the stories are relatively obvious. And so we just need to tell them. <laughs> and, and I don't think it takes talent to, to speak to these stories of of moving forward together into a better way of being, of having more meaningful relationships with each other and the planet. I don't think yeah. it, you have to necessarily be an artist or a storyteller to share and engage in those conversations. And, and maybe, uh, maybe it's the job of artists like us to, to make people, help people feel less angry so the, the, the message of hate and fear will not quite catch so much or, traction. Um, just and then we actually back listen on. to each other. <laughs> To piggyback on that, actually, um, in poetry, we just channel the anger and turn it into productive anger. Yeah, I'm always um, making people angry. <laughs> yeah, it's like better channel it. You walk into a room and no, um, I love what you said because uh, I think what's really cool about the, the generations that are coming up, my youngest sister is five years old, so I'm the oldest of six and we have every single <laughs> span of, yeah, I've got a five-year-old, 11-year-old, 14, and I'm 28, and then there's a 25-year-old, 19-year-old, doesn't matter. Point is, Covered. we all, all of them are so much more well informed than I ever expected a lot of people to be at mm -hmm. that age and I think an informed uh, constituency is always like the best sort of antidote to those kind of stories um, what's really really cool though is that I think everyone everyone has a talent um, and sometimes that talent is picking up on those things not everyone knows that they're being fed a story so the fact that you could recognize that what I would say is study their language break it down, turn it around, and use the same language, um, but turn it around to fit your, your story and your narrative. And just like um, what, you, what you said right now, it was just so funny because I'm like, if you can convince anyone that it will benefit them when it comes to our leadership, they will do it. So if you can, benef if you can convince them that nature you know, listening to each other, like you said, and I really appreciate that because I'm an indigenous woman. So if you, if you can convince anyone that it will benefit them, that our quality of life will be improved, that our um, GDPs will be improved when nature is, a, you know, in a better shape and all of that, then they will, they will actually get on board with your story. So 
Yeah. I love that. We are all <laughs> storytellers. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the incredible panelists. Just later. Matthew.